The Holy Gospel according to Mark, the eighth chapter. Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. For you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, What can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the angels. The Gospel of the Lord. Grace to you and peace from God, our Creator, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I came across a reference to a book this week with the intriguing title, God is Not Nice. It was written by a man named Ulrich Lehner, a history professor and a man of faith. The complete title is actually, God is Not Nice rejecting pop culture theology and discovering the God worth living for. Now, I haven't read the book, but I did read an interview with the author and was struck by a couple of things. The interviewer asked Lehner, why would you go and say in your title that God is not nice? Doesn't God have enough bad press as it is? Lehner responded, nice, is an adjective that describes some vague and superficial pleasantness. If God exists, God God is beauty, truth, and goodness, but not nice. My title is a reminder that many have settled for an idol instead of the real God. Lehner continues, a famous teacher once said that many love God the way they love their cow because she gives milk and cheese. And that's the problem. We expect God to fulfill our needs, but we do not want to integrate ourselves into God's kingdom. And then the author continued, I think God is, for most people, just some glitter in their life, but God is not transforming them. That's why so many are unfulfilled in their faith or abandon it. So the interviewer asked him, what can we do? And he responded, I think the best thing is to live as if God really mattered. I've gotten to know many people, including my own relatives, who would rather go to the gym instead of church on Sundays, but still they believe they are Christian. Yet when you ask them what is specifically Christian about their lives, they can't point to anything except a prayer they say once in a blue moon or a small donation to a charity. What can we do? Live as if God matters, and don't pretend that living with God behind the wheel isn't a struggle. In today's gospel, Peter plunges right into the middle of such a struggle as he wrestles with what it means to be faithful to God's not-so-nice-sounding ways when he takes Jesus aside and rebukes him for teaching about suffering and rejection and being killed. You have to admit that Jesus himself doesn't sound very nice (coughs) when he says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. And then there's this thing about telling people that they need to deny themselves and take up their cross and lose their lives. Hardly a nice introduction if you want to attract new members to Palm Lutheran Church or any church. (coughs) 
Excuse me. <coughs> this book title. <coughs> This book title, God is Not Nice, I think was intended by the author to be a conversation starter. So here's my question in response. If God is not nice, what type of God do we believe in? How would we, Palm Lutheran Church, fill in the blank, God is? What type of God do we point to in our lives of faith in our words and our deeds. Many people I've known over the years have grown up with a sense of a God who is a God of wrath and judgment, a God with power to condemn and to punish sinners and non-believers. There's a very famous 18th century fire and brimstone sermon called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. An angry God certainly reflects an understanding of a God who is definitely not nice. But an angry, judgmental God is not the God that I believe in. It is not my starting point for understanding God. So the question remains, what kind of God do I believe in? What kind of God do you believe in? I think that for many of us, the simple, maybe default answer to that question is to say, God is love. And certainly this is a biblical answer. First John 4 says it that simply, that clearly, God is love. And those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. This is indeed what I believe and what I preach but we need to be clear about what exactly this means for us as followers of Jesus. I have a suspicion that in the arena of popular culture, in popular religiosity, to say that God is love all too easily morphs into that idea that God is nice and that the sum total of what God wants from us is that we be nice too. One of my heroes in the faith, a woman named Dorothy Day, always used to say, love in action is a harsh and dreadful thing compared to love in dreams. The cross is a good example of a place where love in action is a harsh and dreadful thing. (coughs) Love in action, the kind of love that Jesus is talking about in today's gospel, is sacrificial love. It is costly love. The nature of God's love revealed in Jesus is cross-shaped love, a love that meets us in all of the pain and the messiness of living and dying. Cross-shaped love is compassionate love, literally a love that suffers with. This love meets us in our greatest need, in our brokenness, in our hopelessness, in our humanness. God's love revealed in Jesus is a love that gave up strength and power for weakness. A love that gave up acclaim and popularity for condemnation. A love that gave up control for vulnerability. A love that gave up glory for failure on the cross. Whenever I read today's gospel, this exchange between Peter and Jesus, I feel for Peter. Of course he doesn't want his friend to suffer and die. Of course he doesn't want to think that Jesus' mission will end in defeat and shame. Of course he doesn't want to imagine that this man of authority and power wouldn't be able to do what it takes to avoid or to overcome all trouble. And then those words, get behind me Satan, must have been like a stab in the heart for Peter. It may be helpful to pause here and to unpack that word Satan. The word Satan in its basic sense means adversary. So Jesus is not saying that Peter is evil or the devil. 
when he names him Satan. Jesus is saying that in that moment, Peter is acting as an adversary. Peter is getting in the way. He is opposing God's plan. Jesus calls out Peter and tells him to get out of the way, that he needs to listen and to learn. Peter literally needs to get behind Jesus, not in the way out front. Peter needs to follow and to not try to control Jesus as he sets his course towards the cross. This is actually a significant point. Jesus recognizes that there are adversaries as we seek to know God's love and as we seek to be faithful. There are adversaries, stumbling blocks that get in the way and keep us from following God's ways and growing as God's people. These adversaries take many forms and shapes, including our own fear or shame or pride or complacency, uh, the priority of our own agendas or our need to be in control. Jesus is pretty clear though, clear about what it means to be in relationship with him. If any want to become my followers, Let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and the sake of the gospel will save it. I think again of those words from Dorothy Day. Love in action is a harsh and dreadful thing compared to love in dreams. In love, a spouse foregoes his or her plans for the sake of the other. In love, parents put off buying the things they want for the sake of their children. In love, a church decides not to worry about the wear and tear on their building in order to open their doors to shelter the homeless. In love, To deny oneself does not mean a contrived humility or a martyrdom. We do not follow Jesus by demeaning ourselves. We are called to do the very best we can with all the talents and gifts God has given to us. To deny oneself and to follow simply means to keep our priorities in line with what Jesus teaches that the greatest commandments are to love God and to love our neighbors. Or as Jesus said on the night he was betrayed, by this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Following Jesus as he describes today, this way of discipleship means to align ourselves with God's ways and then to work with God for the healing and redemption God desires for this world. But the problem for us, as it was for Peter, always comes back to our tendency to confuse our ways with God's ways, to confuse our agendas with God's agenda. For that reason, we need to keep our focus on the cross. The cross is our compass and our guide. Martin Luther taught that if we wish to know God, God in all God's fullness, we must look to the crucified Christ. The way to recognize God, the way to know God's ways, Luther said, is in the humility and shame of the cross. When we say God is love, we can only know what that means by way of the cross. God's love is most fully revealed and most profoundly demonstrated in that place of suffering and death, in that place we do not expect to find God. But there in that place, what we see is God's will and God's power to meet us in our brokenness. We see God's will and power to forgive sin. We see in that place God's will and power to redeem suffering and death. There at the cross, we see God's love as the source of our life and the source of our hope. It is God's love that transforms the cross from an instrument of death 
into a means of promise and possibility for each one of us. Jesus hints at that in our gospel today in his comment that Peter somehow missed when he got in Jesus' way. Among all of the hard and demanding words Jesus spoke that day, he also said this, after three days, the Son of Man will rise again. And what that means is that cross-shaped love changes everything. The cross tells us that suffering, rejection, and death are not the end of the story. The cross reveals a love that heals, a love that sustains, a love that brings us life. Those who lose their life for the sake of the good news of God's great love will save their lives. Resurrection love is born from the costly, sacrificial love of God revealed on the cross. This promise of life summons us to follow. This promise of life summons us to follow in faith, in hope, and in love. Amen.